Hi, welcome everybody. I am Dave Etkin. Thanks for joining us today. I am the director here in the Louisville Small Business Development Center. Thanks for taking another Tuesday to spend your time with us today. And um, glad you're here. As always, just to make sure that you can hear us, that uh, things are, are um, working well. Uh, if you look to the bottom of your screen, you should see a toolbar. Uh, if you don't, just take your cursor and hover down there and um, you'll see the little chat button. Just hit the chat and uh, type in there, say hello, and um, tell us where you're joining from. It's always great to see where everybody's from and what, what it, um, you know, where they're, where they're joining us from. And um, just to make sure that we don't have any technical glitches, we, we have them from time to time. And let's see. All right, hello everyone. Uh, yeah, just kind of pop in there, say hello. There's Molly, hey Molly, good to see you. West Liberty, okay, the volume is kind of low. All right, let's see what I can do about that. Try to turn that up for you. Tim, hey Tim. Daniel. Yeah, is volume any better? Does that sound better? Nicholasville, Portland. Hey, Deborah, good to see you today. All right, so, well, thanks everybody for joining us today. You know, um, here at the SBDC, we work with tons of entrepreneurs and a lot of those uh, folks are working to start food businesses, um, specifically product businesses or things like that. But um, we thought it'd be very helpful since uh, there's a lot of interest in this to bring on a true expert in the food business. Um, and so we've invited uh, our good friend, uh, Dr. Tim Woods, who is the uh, professor of agriculture e economics at the University of Kentucky. Um, the SBDC is kindly hosted by the University of Kentucky just in full disclosure. So Tim, welcome today. Thank you, David. Great to be here with everybody. Yeah. So um, again, uh, hopefully it looks like everybody's found the chat feature. And as, as we have questions and comments, as we talk to uh, Dr. Tim today, just, you can just put those in the chat and we'll get to them uh, either during the presentation, if it looks like a timely question, or um, we can just wait till the end and we'll have a nice discussion with, uh, with Dr. Tim. So, uh, well, thanks for joining us today, Tim. And I'm just gonna let you go ahead and share your screen and let's get, let's get going because um, you know, there's a lot of people that I know and myself included are interested in this type of subject and, and you've had a lot of success helping entrepreneurs launch and um, really market their business and get some traction. So uh, I know you have a lot of resources and some programs that you can share with everybody that's uh, interested. So just yeah. take it away, Tim. Absolutely. Thank you, David, and appreciate SBDC uh, hosting this here and uh, continuing to provide tools and resources for our food businesses, and other kinds of small businesses around Kentucky. And it's uh, been a longstanding, great uh, partnership and resource, uh, I know, for many of our, our folks. I, I do notice on the call, we've got a, a handful of other folks that are uh, long in the tooth, so to speak, uh, experience with working with food businesses. And so as I'm going through some of these things today, let me just also encourage you uh, to drop other resources and links and, and ideas that you might have with some of the either agencies or programs that you're working with. Uh, this is not going to be a, an exhaustive list of every possible marketing resource today. Uh, but uh, David and I were talking just uh, before we uh, were getting started here, thinking about some of the, the trends that are happening and and particularly relating to food business. And there's a lot going on in Kentucky. And we've seen, uh, especially connected with some of our Kentucky Proud uh, programs, a lot of new uh, food businesses that have stepped into exploring commercial opportunities, a lot of interest from uh, grocers and uh, the restaurant space and other food retailers that are looking for uh, locally produced uh, products. And it's a very exciting time. And even in this uh, kind of trans-COVID, post-COVID, whatever we're calling this now, 
there's even more interest uh, in where does my food come from and looking at these kind of local artisanal products. So what I'm going to do uh, today is uh, just in kind of a relatively short time, fairly informal, uh, please drop questions and ideas or comments in the chat. Uh, but to share just a few bits of marketing outlook for food business, uh, but then sprinkle in some of the marketing resources, particularly from uh, a, a training program that we do largely directed toward uh, farm-based uh, food businesses uh, that is called Market Ready. It's a training program helping farms move into commercial market channels. But a lot of those same marketing resources and marketing principles and support agencies uh, are there to help any kind of a food business. Let's see. There we go. So it's getting it to advance for me. We're all good. So yeah, so what's going on out there? There's so much uh, uh, happening and uh, it would be a whole different uh, training program to talk about really in depth food marketing trends, but I just want to set the stage a little bit with looking at some of the hot button issues that our retailers are looking at as they're seeing local artisanal business, lots of new emphasis in the food marketplace around sustainability, climate smart branding, uh, the fair treatment of uh, employees, humane treatment of animals, lots of uh, issues around uh, nutrition and uh, nutrient dense food products, lots of different ways that food businesses are able to uh, specialize and differentiate and target certain customer groups, for example, that have special dietary needs around gluten, vegan, dairy, et cetera. But we're also seeing a lot of really uh, impressive innovations in distribution that have really come up uh, a big part as a result of what we've seen happen in COVID and where a lot of new home delivery programs, uh, online purchasing, and uh, other ways where customers are coming alongside their food has really changed in the last uh, uh, three years especially. And that's going to be part of what we want to pay attention to as we think about a marketing plan and how do we develop that, that distribution, logistics, uh, and engagement with the customer uh, approach is something we really want to pay close attention to. And so really uh, important new roles now, I think, for online marketing and commerce that are going to be things that we'll especially want to pay uh, attention to. I have a colleague that uh, has pulled this graphic together, just Google searches for different kinds of uh, food concepts. And you can see uh, how things have changed over time just from Google search, what people are looking for related to food. And you can see this blue line here is this cottage food, this kind of local artisanal crafted uh, food that's just continued to go uh, up over the last 20, uh, or so years, and uh, even anything related to local food has been uh, edging up pretty consistently. Uh, and of course, we see when we get around that 2020 period, the time of the pandemic, we see a pretty sharp uptick, uh, especially look at that online grocery space that was rarely uh, something folks thought about, but just has taken such a front and center a point of consideration when we're thinking about food, and it's going to have to be part of our uh, marketing uh, program as we look forward to how people are shopping today. Uh, one of the things that I emphasize in our uh, marketing programs uh, are these things that I refer to as credence attributes. These are Characteristics about the food and uh, answering these kinds of questions for customers, who produced this product? How was this product produced? Where was this product produced? Customers are increasingly asking questions about their food related to these uh, issues, and they all have important implications for our, our branding and our messaging, and it just becomes increasingly important now to be able to signal to our customers, here's 
what's special or distinctive about uh, our our products, and especially in the case where it may be a locally produced uh, product, we want to be sure that customers can recognize that and pick that out of a maybe an otherwise crowded uh, product space. We see uh, in terms of the interest in local products coming up uh, with markets all over the place. And uh, almost every market channel that we can look at here today has some kind of a farm to market channel uh, type program that's going on. And it's creating a lot of new opportunity for uh, not just farm-based foods, but value-added food products uh, of all different kinds. And uh, retailers are setting up special uh, merchandising uh, spaces to be able to do that. Uh, I was talking with Dave earlier about the uh, on-farm retail markets. Uh, we've seen a big, big growth in those uh, here in recent years with a lot of new interest in agritourism. A lot of these markets also uh, are great places to feature uh, uh, locally produced products. Uh, even, you know, it, we have our state parks and we have some of our other market channels like this that have really uh, been looking especially hard for really good quality local, uh, locally produced uh, products. In the, in the marketing training that, that we do, we're not going to have a chance, obviously, to do this in depth. It's a more extensive program, but just a little bit of a, a pointing toward it. We cover a range of different business functions that buyers are saying, this is what we really need from our local vendors for, this, for them to be able to set up a successful marketing uh, partnership with us. And covering these, uh, oh, 15, 18 different key business functions, uh, there are important questions and important strategies and considerations that uh, anybody that's involved marketing into these uh, uh, market channels is going to need to figure out what you're going to need to do there. And we're not going to touch on all these, but I'm going to kind of relate a few marketing resources here that I think are important ones to uh, be aware of. We have a whole website that is set up for our market ready producer uh, training program that is just full of lots and lots of uh, tools, checklists, uh, uh, testimonials, examples, uh, highlights from different training things that we've done. Uh, as I've told Dave, I'll share the uh, uh, slide deck here with everybody and, and it's got a number of these different uh, website links uh, there, but you can just search market ready uh, in your own uh, Google space or whatever uh, search engine you care to use and have a look at this. And, and what we tried to do is organize a lot of these different resources around the key business functions. And, and I think you'll find some useful uh, resources there. But the other thing that uh, I think is, is helpful is you may decide you want to actually go through a training, and you're very welcome. The trainings are free. Uh, we have a lot of great participation in them, but we also have a lot of uh, different special events that we'll have, uh, uh, meet the buyer programs that have been offered uh, regionally. Uh, we've done a few things uh, here even in more recent years where we've done some buyer tours where in the Louisville area, for example, we went and took a uh, several van loads of, of food businesses around to visit places like Rainbow Blossom and the Jefferson County uh, Public School Commissary and uh, some other different uh, restaurants and retailers that were sourcing local products and giving our folks an opportunity to have a conversation with these buyers to say, what is it that you're looking for in a vendor? And I think those kinds of uh, uh, opportunities to really have those in-person exchanges are really uh, helpful. So keep an eye on those upcoming events and, and uh, we'll certainly be offering those uh, in different places around the state uh, as well. Uh, but one of the things that is important in the space of communication, where I just want to spend just a little bit of extra time, is uh, the importance of social media. Uh, I'd mentioned there earlier in uh, 
the importance of how people are looking for their food. This uh, online retail marketing uh, has just exploded. Every uh, grocer, every restaurant, every food business is really having to step up their game for how they are interacting with their customers. And it's not just how to do online commerce. It's really how to do online uh, messaging and uh, brand development and relationship building with your customers. Uh, a lot of these folks that are doing a really good job in this space uh, have been very thoughtful about it and have been working in these uh, areas of social media uh, development uh, for a long time, multiple platforms, developing really good content and uh, uh, really excited uh, legitimately about the storytelling around the local food uh, spaces here. And so uh, what you're going to need to be thinking about as a food business is what does your social media uh, program look like? You go into a little restaurant like the local taco there in Lexington, uh, that's just opened up its second uh, uh, second location, and you'll see them featuring their different local food businesses and farms that they're working with. Uh, but social media uh, uh, links are everywhere there, and it's part of it's the clientele that they've got coming into the into the restaurant. But part of it is they just recognize the value of that social media space and partnering with their customer base to share the things that are going on and that are distinctive about uh, the products there at the local taco. So when we think about a social media marketing plan, uh, again, we almost need a whole another separate uh, training program uh, here to really look at what does it take to develop an, an effective social media marketing plan. But at the very least, you're going to need to think about platform choice, design, content, uh, and then the goals that you have for your social media plan and how are you going to evaluate if your social media activity is actually driving people to your site, driving people to your products, and most importantly, driving people to buy more of your products. And a thoughtful social media marketing plan is going to uh, be constantly coming in and looking at metrics and uh, trying different uh, approaches and different uh, 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 activities and messages and ways of engagement to constantly turn the dials there a little bit to try to uh, advance your customer engagement. Part of the social media marketing plan is the promotion, but part of it increasingly is also commerce and where you're giving people opportunity to be able to buy or uh, schedule uh, uh, services and products through your website. And there are lots of really good uh, resources and tools that are out there. Again, we don't have time to go into all these uh, here today, but what I'm going to suggest here is to get a social media business advisor. And I know Dave and his team have some really great people there at SBDC and uh, encourage you to follow uh, back with them. I've been working uh, somewhat recently more and more with a gal, Amanda Kelly, uh, down in uh, uh, Somerset area with a small business training director down there for the uh, Southeast Kentucky Economic Development uh, Corp. Uh, there's Amanda's uh, contact information many uh, good folks in the area that can help evaluate uh, your current social media uh, activities, but also kind of give you tips and tools on how to do that better. We do have some uh, good training resources that we've collected from uh, Amanda and others uh, that we've got on our uh, Market Ready uh, website. And so we'll encourage you to have a look there. In our extension programming at the University of Kentucky, a lot of the things that I do as well uh, is working with our farmers that are involved with uh, direct marketing. And we've developed a whole training curriculum called Marketing for All. And while it is intended and kind of targeted for small farms, it's really more generally targeted for small businesses. And we've got a whole 
collection of resources on social media basics, basics of web design, uh, some really good uh, tools and software tools and, and resources that can help you uh, think about the approach that you're going to want to have with your uh, uh, social media marketing uh, activities. Uh, Brett Wolf is my uh, key guy that's working in that area. I've given you Brett's contact uh, there below. And again, we'll share uh, these resources uh, later. But uh, have a look at this Marketing for All uh, uh, collection of resources there as well uh, to get some kind of ideas on, on how to move uh, forward with some of this. Uh, lots more we could say about the social media pieces, but Connected in with communication is also uh, the idea of your brand and your logo and the kind of presentation and sort of the distinctive way that your products are going to be identified by your customers as, as distinct and unique from everybody else. And I know you guys all know this, that a well-designed logo is going to complement your brand and customers are going to see logos as much as they're going to see the product. It's the logo that's going to get that sort of first take, the product, the second take. And you really want people to uh, move toward that first trial. Nobody's going to try a product the second time until they try it the first time. And that first trial is hugely impacted by the packaging, the presentation, and the, and the professionalism of the logo. In our world of local foods marketing, especially, we see restaurants, grocers, and other uh, schools and other folks that are involved in uh, promoting the local food products, they love a good quality logo. And it'll show up in all kinds of different uh, spaces where they're doing their own kinds of marketing of your products. And so getting somebody that can help you develop a good quality logo is a really worthwhile investment. We'll talk some more about uh, just some approaches that you might be able to take to explore that. I mentioned the Galrein uh, Farms over there in Shelbyville, uh, a beautiful little on-farm retail market, but they've just done a really good job uh, putting their farm estate brand out uh, over everything. And it's really uh, helped them to carve out a distinct uh, place there in the, in the food market. One resource that I also uh, wanted to be sure I left you folks with today uh, that uh, some of you may or may not be aware of, when we talk about value-added products that are going to require uh, 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 labels that, yes, they need to be attractive, yes, they need to have a really attractive-looking logo, but there may be certain requirements that correspond with a processed food product that will require a statement of ingredients, a statement of nutrition, uh, and net weight, and other kinds of uh, uh, measures that are legally required on uh, a label like that. And one of the resources that we have developed at the University of Kentucky is a center called the Food Systems Innovation Center. Candy Williams is our key uh, contact over there, and I highly, highly recommend you if you are uh, looking at developing a, a new value-added food product, a recipe of any kind, if you're batching up, if you're looking at new packaging, if you're wanting to evaluate uh, food safety uh, considerations, uh, reach out to uh, Candy. There's a, a whole team of folks that are connected in with the uh, Food Systems Innovation Center that work with Kentucky food businesses uh, uh, all year long on all kinds of different kinds of products. And uh, many of the services are fee-based, but in many cases, they can talk you through just very basic kinds of questions that you might have uh, and will encourage you at some point, uh, though, to come in, sit down with them and look at how to develop your product uh, better. And part of that it is is with the labeling and the nutrition labeling and making sure that you're meeting the various regulatory requirements that the, uh, uh, the public safety branch uh, may require. Many, many other good resources that the FSIC and the market ready folks have available. 
Do I need scanner codes and other kinds of things for my uh, UPC codes for my labels and resources there that can help you get uh, up to speed with uh, just how to do that? And, and uh, we could certainly talk about that some more as we need to. But I want to uh, sort of pull this uh, uh, thinking about the logo and the presentation piece uh, together here with a, a pointer to a Kentucky Department of Ag marketing cost share program that is there for you food businesses that are developing a value added products, moving into commercial markets. That is uh, uh, an amazing program, point of purchase grant program uh, that uh, Jonathan Van Balen manages there at KDA. Uh, has been used by many, many of our different uh, food businesses uh, around Kentucky to really help uh, with raising uh, raising the bar, moving the needle, if you will, on the professionalism and presentation of our uh, labels that are going on our packages uh, around uh, the different market channels where our folks are selling uh, uh, selling local food products here, uh, today. Highly encourage you, if you're if you're processing a food product, you're eligible to be uh, a Kentucky Proud uh, member. There's no cost to become a Kentucky Proud member, and that opens the opportunity for you to participate in a lot of, of really uh, strong programs that we've got that partner with many of our different restaurants, retailers, schools, uh, and others. But uh, getting help to uh, work through the right kind of packaging, the right kind of labeling, and the professional presentation, and to have the opportunity potentially even for cost share, uh, especially when you're doing some local sourcing or working with farms and can show some farm impact uh, uh, with some of the food products that you're developing. It's an awesome resource. And, uh, you know, I'm not working for KDA or anything. Uh, I'm just telling you we are very fortunate in Kentucky to have a really strong Department of Ag that provides really good support uh, for our folks in this area. Uh, so, you know, as we talk with uh, some of our different folks, just the last couple of things that I want to uh, mention here today, and then we can maybe throw it open for some questions or conversations. But Marketing uh, can show up in lots of different platforms. And one of the ways that many times gets overlooked is in the distribution and logistics. And many of you guys have probably seen different uh, panel trucks or things like this. Certainly part of the marketing challenge for a lot of our small food business folks is this question of logistics and distribution and how do I get my product out into some of these different distribution channels? And doing some of your own uh, uh, direct to store, direct to retailer delivery is a very common thing for our folks that are very small. Some different alternative strategies that are uh, available out there. But of course, the bigger you get, the more compelling it's going to be to start to think about working with a third party delivery company or a wholesaler distributor that themselves is working with restaurants, grocers, schools. And we have a number of really good uh, businesses like this that have done a really good job with many of our food vendors uh, in Kentucky uh, and themselves are recognizing the value and importance of this kind of local food, artisanal product, uh, cottage food space. Uh, uh, we can talk some more about some of those uh, those opportunities of where to plug in and where to look for. And I'll show you some resources here at the end. Uh, but finding those good marketing distribution partners is another really important part of the marketing uh, plan that you're going to want to uh, think about. When you're doing distribution, you need to think about uh, putting your brand out everywhere, every possible opportunity that you've got on your business to business communication, uh, uh, documents, uh, on your invoices, uh, but even on your uh, vans and delivery trucks where you're moving uh, products out and around town, people can see that uh, uh, the name of that company and, and promote everywhere uh, that you're going. 
when we think about developing uh, marketing materials, the last couple of things I just want to uh, say here, one of the things that, that we found working with our farms has been uh, the, the buyers really, really value this uh, personalized human interest connection. So here, even with uh, something like a guy growing onions, the picture of this guy out here just loving on his onions really is a strong selling point. And especially in the restaurant space and where people are trying to tell the story of food, uh, having that human interest connection uh, is really valuable. And I think this uh, similarly can apply into many of our other uh, cottage food and artisanal food uh, market spaces. One of the ways that I feel is uh, still really underutilized uh, in doing some of that storytelling is using QR codes. And we've seen uh, uh, QR codes really accelerate in use during the uh, COVID pandemic time. Uh, as people are shopping online, many of you guys have probably been out to restaurants. You remember we had to, in many cases, pick up our menu using a QR code. <laughs> uh, but it's it's moved people back into being comfortable with that. And what the QR code does is it links uh, the person with the smartphone device to a website that can have all kinds of information to tell stories about uh, your food product. Several of my favorite applications with a QR code, one is a local winery that you click on the QR code and it takes you to this little very short video looking through the vineyard over to the winery, but then it lands uh, very impressively on here are the best food pairings that would go with this wine. Another example that I really love with the QR code example was uh, over in East Kentucky, uh, a family that was doing popcorn and talking about uh, the importance of uh, their organic production system and sustainable farming production system with a view towards saving the bats that are in the caves in the areas around them. And you can scan on the QR code and it takes you into that story and it takes you into pictures and video clips. So much uh, interesting, creative storytelling things I think that we can do uh, in this QR code space. QR codes are free. Uh, again, on the Market Ready website, you can download a, a very simple one page how to do QR codes uh, or talk to uh, some other folks maybe that have a little more uh, familiarity with how to do those. Uh, I think they're really, uh, really clever and uh, potentially a really valuable marketing uh, a platform for us. But when you go into grocery stores and other kinds of restaurant spaces, other retailers, you'll see back to that human interest connection uh, as they're promoting their local products that are going back to those pictures and images uh, 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 point of sale merchandising that has the story of the product, uh, the story of the, the producer or the vendor uh, that's all around the store, dairy products, uh, packaged food products, uh, fresh produce, meat products. Uh, we have a lot of great uh, food products coming from food businesses doing all kinds of different things around Kentucky. Uh, and the retailers themselves are really, I feel, stepping up their game in terms of being able to promote. This is from the Rainbow Blossom there in Louisville. And you go into their stores and you'll just see all around the store, uh, all the different places where they're sourcing local uh, food products. This is not just a Kentucky phenomenon. We're really seeing this interest in the local products coming from uh, uh, retailers all over the country. And it's certainly a driving trend and an opportunity, I think, for our uh, local producer vendors to uh, be better promoting and to, to uh, kind of proudly promote and put forward the small artisanal uh, uh, human interest connection that you've got with your food products to the customers that really value uh, these kinds of attributes. Uh, we've seen 
Uh, of course, I mentioned our Department of Ag. Uh, other state departments of Ag also have similar kinds of promotions, but it's really back again to those uh, pictures and human interest uh, connections. And so just to kind of pull it together here, uh, you know, if you're thinking about developing your marketing plan, the social media uh, and digital platforms are going to be really important. The uh, logo and design and presentation of your a product's going to be important. Uh, uh, you'll want to, of course, make sure you're in compliance with any kind of regulatory requirements that might be connected with your uh, branding and packaging. But ultimately, the thing that's going to drive your marketing program is understanding what is the value of what I'm selling. And once you understand the value of the human interest connection to your a quality of product that will influence your packaging, your logos, your partnerships in terms with your different distributors uh, that themselves, you want to find somebody that's going to have a complementary uh, marketing plan to what you're trying to do. Uh, uh, really important. Uh, this is a super short list to what uh, really is a much longer list, but just a uh, in the interest of our time today, I wanted to just be sure uh, that you had a couple of key contacts of some really, really great resource people that also do a ton of really good work with our food businesses. Uh, uh, Deanne Elmore with KDA and uh, Chad Smith and uh, uh, several of our other folks that work there at KDA uh, are out there on a regular basis working with our local distributors, grocers, other buyers, uh, as kind of a liaison between our Kentucky Proud products and our, our retailers that are out there. Highly encourage you, drop uh, Deanne a note and talk to her about what it is that you're producing and, and what kind of markets you're looking for. Uh, another really good resource uh, on the marketing front is uh, the uh, good folks at KCARD, the Kentucky Center for Ag and Rural Development. Uh, Brent Lackey is the new executive director there, but has a long, long history of working, especially with uh, uh, meat products, uh, but with other kind of small food businesses as well. And the final thing I want to put out there is a relatively new uh, development. One thing that I'm really excited about, and I think will be very complementary to many of the things our folks at KDA are doing, but we have a program at the University of Kentucky called the UK Food Connection, uh, my colleague Ashton Potter Wright leads that program, but she's just recently hired three uh, what we're referring to as regional uh, value chain coordinators. And these are folks that work with our food businesses to try to help them make connections into the marketplace. And we've got a, a West Kentucky, Central Kentucky, and East Kentucky uh, uh, value chain uh, coordinator encourage you to reach out to Ashton and just uh, make a connection there uh, uh, with respect to uh, what that program is looking like. And uh, Ashton and her group have really continued to ramp up lots and lots of good promotion around local foods, connections with uh, some of our different buyers. And so uh, finally giving my contact too, I would love to hear from any of you. Uh, uh, ideas, questions, markets that you're exploring, uh, products that you're trying to develop, uh, questions you might have about packaging or distribution or any of the things that we talked about just very uh, quickly or briefly today, uh, uh, would be very happy to uh, follow back up with you there. So uh, I guess with that, David, that, that kind of pulls me to a a pausing point there to see, do folks have some questions or uh, some kind of uh, even just some further comments maybe about some of the products they're trying to develop or mm -hmm. uh, folks maybe they're working with themselves. I see we've got some kind of technical advisor uh, folks that are here as well. Questions about certain kinds of food businesses uh, would be happy to jump into that conversation. Yeah, to your point, Tim, I mean, this is a great opportunity uh, for, for folks who really to ask some pointed questions to you about, um, you know, where they are on their journey, what some challenges they may be having, and just get a quick, you know, quick um, bit of advice from you. So 
uh, feel free to jump in anytime um, to, to let that uh, let that go. So um, let me ask you this, Tim. Um, what uh, what would be the um, especially you know I, I think that um, um, most people that are that are launching a food uh, product business um, they they can figure out what they want to do and they they understand the craft itself and to your point um, the hard part really is marketing and, and penetrating the market I mean where you know you you've shared a lot of resources and had a lot of discussion on different points but where what would be the one thing that you would tell them to to do first what would be the the, the really uh, first point the real starting point yeah I would say uh, trying to trying to know your customer as well as you possibly can uh, and whether that's through some uh, uh, kind of informal uh, surveys that you might do, some uh, conversations in with uh, some buyers or retailers, uh, go into one of these grocery stores and talk to them a little bit about here's the product that I'm working with and talk to me about what your customers are seeing. And, you know, anybody that's in a business at all, I, I like to use this example a lot in the restaurant space. The chef knows what's happening and what products they want to keep putting on the menu when they see what plates are coming back clean and what products are working out there that are coming out of the kitchen. And they'll turn the dials accordingly. You know, people that people that produce things at a farmer's market, they know what products sell and you start to just develop this feedback in, in a conversation that you're having with your buyers about uh, not just the products, but what about the packaging? What about the, uh, uh, the volumes, the distribution and logistics, uh, uh, the logo, you know, constantly be looking for that kind of, uh, that kind of feedback. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Um, I, I, I do just a, Piggyback on that, I do think that a lot of people feel like they have to sell to everybody that the world is their market. And um, to your point, I don't, I don't think that's the case either. I think that if you can uh, really understand your niche uh, and dominate that niche, that's where you actually make make money. Right. Yeah, I see a question in here. Uh, you know about. Uh, being a micro having your microprocessor and processor uh, certification is uh, uh, obviously a great step. Uh, uh, that opens the door for you to be able to do a lot of things and and uh, taking taking sample products to a potential uh, retailer. A nice thing that we've got in the say in the Louisville market very particularly is we have a number of small grocers and small on-farm markets or, or, or small uh, grocery markets that feature a lot of local food products that can start small. And you can trial some things and pilot some things and move and explore into some things where there might be a, a, a seasonal opportunity to merchandise some events, uh, you know, in the spring or in the fall when there's a big, uh, push for local products. Uh, you know, the, the Kentucky Derby and some of the other famous kind of big social events are always great activities as well, where retailers are looking to especially promote these kind of local products like this. So you don't necessarily have to be in there with a retailer thinking about being a large volume year round supplier. You can start small. Where, where was a good place to start uh, small like that? I mean, you mentioned, um, you know, online. I know shipping can be a problem with that. I mean, where, where would where would somebody want to start? Uh, well, it depends on the market channel that you're that you're wanting to look at. Uh, you know, if you're wanting to sell through a grocery uh, space, uh, you know, it's really just going to the store itself and talking with the category a manager about what it is that you're doing. Uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a great, that's a great starting point. Uh, in some cases, you'll see uh, chefs and other restaurants that 
would love to have some support from some other products. I see a question here, but somebody talking about being a new baker. Uh, mm -hmm. If you've got a, a line of baked uh, goods or desserts or, or uh, breads or pastries or things like this that maybe could complement what a restaurant is, is trying to do, uh, uh, work with a couple of those restaurants that have a really good reputation of working with local producers. Uh, and there are a number of them around the Louisville area, for sure, that uh, have just done a super job, have a really good reputation uh, for working with local producers. Uh, I I wish I could say I knew of a good mentorship uh, opportunity for new bakers. That's a, it's a need, and I appreciate the value, uh, you know, for something like that. Uh, I'll have to think about that. I'll make a note and see if see if there might not be a way to help make a connection. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but to your point earlier, I mean, um, even with bakers, I mean, understanding who the customer is and looking for that channel, I think is is spot on what you said earlier on is, yeah. is the first step to that understanding that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it kind of reminds me of a story of, um, uh, I was working with these folks, they they actually sold knitting supplies, which, you know, I, I, I always kind of wanted to knit and never took it up or anything. But um, I went with them to this little trade show. And, you know, uh, when they were when we were meeting at Starbucks or something in Louisville, they were just people. But when they went to this trade show, they were actually semi famous because they had such a, a well known a reputation in, in their niche. I mean, they were commanding that niche and it was really interesting how well they had done with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I mentioned before we have these different functions that we do in the market in the market ready program of a meet the buyer program. And we've done some things before, for example, at the headquarters there at the Kentucky Farm Bureau uh, office there. Uh, for example, have a big kind of a round table uh, with lots of other kind of side tables where buyers are present and just a chance for folks to kind of go table to table and have these conversations with different uh, buyers about what is it that they're looking for. And uh, even if you had some samples of products, if here's what we're doing and uh, talking about how do we do even basic nuts and bolts things like uh, invoicing or uh, online business to business communication. How how do you like that to look? And there's just very candidly, David, there's no substitute for just uh, picking up the phone, so to speak, or stopping in the, the food business and talking to people. Right. And, and uh, uh, yeah, just uh, continuing to just kind of knock and look for those contacts and, and uh, you know, we've got a we've got a really good thriving local food program talking to other vendors that have have uh, been successful themselves, maybe even not in exactly the same product, uh, but are trying to move into similar kinds of stores. Uh, you know, you might go in to visit a store and see some other uh, local food suppliers that are there. Go talk with those folks. Mm -hmm. And uh you know, I think there's a, a lot of value in that kind of peer-to-peer. -peer. How are you handling logistics? How are you handling pricing? Uh, things like this. Yeah. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about, um, about your um, market-ready program that's coming up sometime soon? Yeah. So uh, we have... Uh, 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 we try to offer them roughly three to four times a year. Uh, and, and what we'll do is uh, uh, have basically a core training that is roughly a 90 minute uh, to a two hour type program. And then we follow that up with advanced topic uh, discussions and uh, kind of take people through those kind of core 
uh, business functions that we showcased uh, there earlier, but obviously go into a lot more depth than we were able to uh, here today. And, you know, it's a, it's an opportunity for folks to, uh, uh, especially in the advanced topic, you know, we're going to talk with somebody about packaging. We'll bring somebody in like that works with the Rockford Packaging Company or one of these other uh, companies like this that really talks nuts and bolts about the scale economies and the costs that come with large volume purchasing and how do I think about label and design. Uh, and so I, I just feel like th that content and that material is so helpful for uh, folks that are especially newer into this kind of food business and uh, uh, an opportunity for them to kind of ask questions very specifically about the kinds of needs they might have, uh, particularly a challenge, of course, you know, in this in this food business is they're so different. And, you know, the insurance issues, the packaging issues, the quality issues are very different from one kind of food to another. And, uh, you know, the supply chains look different. And uh, so we see ourselves needing to try to move people fairly quickly into some kind of very general things that we'll study in this market ready training into some more specific kind of help that we can offer through say the food systems innovation center that's a little bit more tailored to a one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh program that's uh that leads to another question any advice for hospitality startups moving a brand into the area mm, yeah uh yeah, so uh, of course the hospitality industry covers a pretty a broad uh, space. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if we're talking about like a, a bed and breakfast type uh, arrangement or some other other kind of service, we do have uh, one thing that I would really encourage uh, these folks to have a look at is uh, with our folks from the Kentucky Farm Bureau, the certified. Uh, uh, farm market program, and uh, that's a uh, program that has grown now to somewhere 110, 120 or so different entities across the state that are doing the whole range of different kinds of uh, tourism, and many of these folks do have uh, wedding venues and uh, other kinds of uh, hospitality service things that they're offering uh, as part of their their farm farm stays. Uh, you know, I think t being able to to explore with some of those folks, and even talking with uh, uh, the folks there at uh, Kentucky Farm Bureau uh, about what that program uh, is about. If that might be, I don't know the details of what this hospitality startup. Uh, is in, is involving if it's going to involve some uh, provision of food, a small restaurant, or uh, connected with it, or what that's going to look like. Uh, but we can uh, certainly encourage them. Follow, follow. Send me an email note, and I can help make some some connections there. Okay. So I see the question about uh, connecting to you know through the training today or through a market ready training to be eligible for Kentucky Proud, it's easier than that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a <clears throat> it's a free online uh, application that uh, you can just go to the Kentucky Proud uh, website there. Uh, uh, I've given you uh, uh, Deanne Elmore's uh, contact there. She can certainly help walk people through that, that sign up space. But once you're signed up and registered as a Kentucky Proud either farmer or food business, uh, that opens the door for being able to participate then in a lot of other grant and support uh, programs. And uh, having an agency like KDA advocating for you, talking to some of the different, especially some of the bigger uh, retailers is a really, really helpful tool. And there's some really good people there. So baking cakes and specialty yeah. flavors, that's so fun. Uh, and what a neat opportunity and ways to be really creative. Uh, 
Dave, you and I were talking before uh, the folks up in uh, Newport that had that little incubator mm -hmm. right. uh, space there for folks that are doing uh, food businesses selling up into northern Kentucky in the Louisville area. I mean, the Cincinnati area uh, uh, and just a, a remarkable platform there to be able to make a connection into a big market. And uh, even in the Louisville area, there's a big market uh, here for these kinds of specialized uh, products. Whenever you're dealing with these kind of artistic uh, and custom products like this, the social media space is absolutely imperative to get figured out. And, uh, you know, if you're wanting people to uh, be able to inquire about design or schedule certain kinds of uh, cakes to be made uh, or, or, or having a certain uh, inventory that's going to be available for a certain special function uh, that may need to be planned for, uh, or even just to be able to feature certain kinds of, you know, you're talking about specialty flavors. I'm not exactly sure what sort of specialty flavors are involved, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, there's there's a lot of interest in uh, things like uh, even pawpaw or bourbon or Kentucky unique or Kentucky specific kinds of, of of flavors and twists that can kind of bring this kind of a local uh, flavor uh, uh, into the kind of marketing and messaging that you're doing mm -hmm. that. Uh, Lots of room to obviously be super creative. Definitely. Um, on, on that note, do you, do you have any advice for someone? I know you just talked about, you know, stopping by, but um, is, does, do you know of anyone that has any success like penetrating in like the larger franchise market, like with uh, selling to restaurants? Um, I know like a franchise concept, you know, doesn't have a lot of freedom to make those decisions locally um so you mean like a processed food product selling to restaurants yeah that or even like the specialty cakes like selling you know desserts to oh sure to sure yeah no that that's a that's a possibility uh you know the selling to restaurants uh is kind of is you know, the, a, a challenge in the restaurant space uh, is a lot of times the identity of the product and where that product is coming from will get lost in the translation of moving it into menus, onto plates. Uh, we do have some restaurants that do a good job that will feature uh, a local cheese that comes from a Kentucky dairy, for example. Uh, uh, and they may uh, also do a good job uh, featuring uh, a Kentucky food artisan uh, that that might be included there. I'm, I'd have to think a little bit more about a great example of that. But to me, the much more uh, promising channel there is in some of these on-farm retail markets mm -hmm. that are trying to promote local uh, food products like this that are things they might not have, but they can promote them as this is a Kentucky-made uh, product uh, or the state parks uh, or some of these small independent retailers. Uh, uh, you know, even I know it's not always uh, that popular for folks, but to do a, uh, uh, you know, a farmer's market uh, venue uh, can be just a fantastic retail setting uh, to be able to, to explore some different kinds of uh, products, recipes, packaging, have lots of customer conversations. Uh, that's a great place to learn uh, about your customer community. Uh, let's see, Bridget has several questions here. Uh, as a home-based processor, I cannot sell my baked goods through retail. I have a regular bi-weekly market that fits me, but I would like to find some more events where I could sell uh, that don't take place regularly. Where can I find them like Oktoberfest or Christmas mm -hmm. markets? She says she's tried Facebook ads and gotten nothing from them. Mm -hmm. 
if you give some advice about how to get responses from Facebook or other way to advertise like that, she's a home base processor. Um, so, yeah, what do you think? Uh, where's she located? Mm, I don't know. She doesn't say. Uh, so Tori answered a little bit. Says you could try joining the Kentucky Vendor Events, Craft Shows, and Business Promotions Facebook group and other similar groups. Oh yeah, that would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. and I know you know it's uh, the Department of Ag folks do a good job mm -hmm. uh, keeping up with those kinds of events. Uh, you know, a lot of times even just making a connection with your local county extension folks in terms of community events and functions uh, where there may be trade show type uh, vendor opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times the extension agent's gonna be dialed into those. Uh, you know, the, I know the state parks around the, around the state all have their own kind of parade of various uh, festival activities. Mm -hmm. I've always used to joke that Kentucky ought to be the, instead of the land of 10,000 lakes, we should be the land of 10,000 festivals. <laughs> right, uh, and there are a lot of them, and and some great opportunities for uh, uh, vendors to step in and and engage a good crowd. Yeah, Bridget says she's in Louisville. Okay. Yeah. Um, Sharon asks. Uh, she says, "My husband and I are interested in starting a food truck, but all we have right now is a basic recipe. We would like to start testing interest at local vendor events and grow from there, but we don't even have equipment yet. What should we do first? Mm. Yeah, well, I would say, you know, getting a, getting a good, uh, getting a good product is the first, mm -hmm. the first thing, uh, you know, there are, there are certain licenses and things that you're going to have to get to be able to participate as a, to sell through a food truck. Yeah. Uh, uh, of course, but, uh, but even before you kind of go to that level, uh, you know, I think, developing some different uh, products and trying, uh, uh, you know, again, at, at whether it's at a festival type event or at a uh, farmer's market type event uh, where you can uh, set up in a, in a kiosk type sort of setting uh, that might not be that mobile, but at least you can test out the, uh, the concept there with, with some customers. I think it's a good low cost starting point uh, that I would try. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a the food truck space is growing so fast. Uh, we certainly see them all over the place in Lexington. Yeah, in Louisville uh, as well. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. Uh, Molly says, "Do you have any advice on setting up a wholesale account with a local coffee shops and places like that? I own a small bakery, and I'm not yeah. sure how to get started." Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, well, uh, I guess my main advice would be to just go into the coffee shop and talk to uh, talk to the owners, uh, bring samples of your products. Uh, you know, I know some of the local coffee shops there around the Louisville area are very sympathetic to local products. They're local entrepreneurs themselves. Uh, and I think would be open-minded to being able to support uh, products from a local bakery. Uh, you know, I'm I'm aware we've got a, a one of my favorite coffee shops in the Lexington area. Actually, <clears throat> they they don't have a bakery there themselves, but uh, they use products from the Good Foods Co-op from their bakery that are featured there in their uh, coffee shop, and it's a great partnership. Uh, that's mm -hmm. developed, and uh, it's a really good idea. So, uh, just encourage, bring some samples, uh, go in and talk to some of those, uh, some of those vendors, and you know, see what their experience, of course, is with some with some uh, different products. But uh, you know, there may be you know another kind of a neat thing that we're seeing with a lot of the coffee shops is they're doing. Uh, uh, at business service. Uh, and so there may be ways to kind of blend it into a coffee service, catering service, uh, a kind of an opportunity that could be actually kind of a neat uh, business idea. 
-hmm. Well, we've gone a little bit over our time. I think we should be mindful of everybody's work schedules today, including yeah. yours. You know, <laughs> so uh, I really, one of this was a great session. I really learned a lot, and I know everyone else did. So, thank you so much, Tim. Thanks for spending your time. It's with my us. pleasure, David. I I uh, love working with in this food space, and love the questions. And thanks everybody for uh, joining here today. And Hopefully picked up a few tips and ideas and resources. I'll send the uh, uh, slides out there for you, David, to share out with uh, everybody and and uh, uh, would love to hear from folks. So thanks for having me on today. Thank you, Tim. And uh, like Tim said, we'll send the slides out to you in the recording uh, probably today or maybe tomorrow morning. So thanks for joining us today and we'll see you next week on another Toolkit Tuesday. And thank you, Tim. We'll see you soon. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. See ya. Bye.